Well, I want to start by thanking uh, Alex and Bill for all their help in arranging for this program today. And also, I have to throw out an additional shout out to Carl Franz for he originally signed me up to do this two years ago when the COVID epidemic first hit. And then we had a lot of delays. I think we've scheduled this thing twice already and had to postpone it. Uh, so here I am today. I'm not there in person, which I, I regret. Uh, but I have, again, like, like uh, Bill mentioned, I have COVID to blame for that. Uh, I came down with it a little over a week ago while hosting, hosting a trains magazine tour of New England with my wife, Allison. And we got back to Milwaukee a week ago yesterday, on last Friday, and both tested positive. It didn't feel too good that day. Quickly started to feel better, though. And on Monday and, and Wednesday, I tested negative. So I don't think I've had, I'm, I don't have it anymore, but I still have a few symptoms, just like a bad cold. So uh, we decided not to travel. But um, the good news is uh, we're all feeling good now. And I'm looking forward to going through this maturely with y'all, with y'all today. Meanwhile, I've kept that program from two years ago on ice and made occasional updates to it. And that's what I'm bringing you today. Uh, I'm not much of a photographer, so I'm not, I'm not like Alex Mays, for instance. <laughs> I'm not one of those people who can pull a slideshow out of my hat. <clears throat> but one thing I can do is plunge into the Kambach Media Library and come up with various themes for various organizations like today. And the library is such a, a wonderful resource. It's something like 100,000 photographs not to mention thousands of books and other material, including timetables and correspondence and all that kind of stuff. It occurred to me that members of the Potomac chapter might enjoy seeing more of the photographs trains collected over the years showing railroading in your general area. So, and I figured your interest in, uh, in Maryland area railroading is pretty wide ranging. So we're gonna travel from Northern Virginia up through Washington toward Baltimore and then west along the Potomac, pretty deep into West Virginia and Western Maryland. A lot of familiar uh, railroads will pop up, especially the B&O, which I figured is a favorite of everyone there today. Uh, but there's lots more, um, the Pennsylvania, the Southern, C&O, RF&P, not to mention a little bit of Amtrak. It creeps into the 70s. Uh, it's all black and white, ranging from the late 1940s up to the mid-1970s. And it definitely demonstrates the amazing variety of what we have in the Kambach Library. I would also add this, too, as I go through this and, and kind of read some of the captions uh, and repeat what you see on the screen. If anybody has anything they wanna add to the photograph, like something I haven't spotted, or mo most certainly if I make a mistake, please chime in for the, for the benefit of everybody in the audience. I'm, I'm all for this being an audience participation thing if, if, if we can do it that way. Uh, you're also gonna see some pretty famous credit lines here today. Jim Shaughnessy, William D. Middleton, H. Reed, William P. Price, James Gallagher, and even one photo by the great Lucius Beebe. I'm proud of the fact that a couple of them, Shaughnessy and Middleton, became good friends during my tenure as editor of Trains in the 1990s. So I'm gonna dedicate the program to all those intrepid shooters out there who got out there and left us with such a wonderful visual record of railroad and railroading in the mid 20th century. And with that, I'm gonna start working the controls here and hopefully if this goes the way we want it to, we'll start seeing the images. I'm starting out with something fairly recent. This is from 1976, when I'm sure many of you were out there to see this. The Southern Pacific Daylight Engine came up from Atlanta on a ferry move from uh, Atlanta to Washington, D.C. to rejoin the American Freedom Train. And I was along on that trip. Um, and I'm not, a, I don't think I'm in this crowd somewhere, but I might be. Uh, I just like this photo because I wanted to include something from the great John Gruber. Uh, this is just a grab shot, but it has all the earmarks of, of Gruber. His, his photographs have a lot of life to them, partly because he was so eager to include people in his pictures. But here's another great shot from that same trip. Um, and this is the daylight engine coming over the bridge at Lynchburg. Um, I'm on the train, so I couldn't have gotten this photograph. But uh, thank goodness, the, the great Mike Eagleson, the uh, longtime uh, writer, columnist for Railroad Magazine with his In Search of Steam column, he was there to get this photograph. And I'm sure next to him are probably a, a hundred other photographers on that hillside getting this very same great shot. Here's another shot from that trip that day. And this was by my buddy and, and one-time boss, Dave Ingalls, the late Dave Ingalls, who died a couple of years ago. Uh, I just like the contrast Dave caught between the 4449 and, and fleet cars, which in 1976 were the latest thing, pretty much. 
Now we're going to switch just to go a, another, uh, ahead another year to 1977. And here's a photograph I came across by the great Don Wood, the famous PRR photographer and other subjects. And here's the crowd gathered for the dedication of Amtrak's GG14935 at Washington Union Station when they restored the engine to the Brunswick Green paint scheme and did some other work on it. It looks to me like there's a, a bluegrass band or something on the rear platform of Pennsylvania 120, the business car. You can see the guy playing a dobro there. Uh, what I remember about the dedication, well, of course, what I remember most is how beautiful the engine was and the trip that came along afterwards. But I also remember that Raymond Lowy, the great designer himself, spoke to the crowd and what sticks in my mind is the way he pronounced GG1. He pronounced it the way Louis, Louis Jordan pronounced Leslie Caron's name in the movie Gigi. And he talked about how much he loved the Gigi1. And I always thought that was pretty cool. Here it is that same day uh, on its second run after the restoration. At least that's what the photographer said on the back of the print. Here we see 4935 rolling through the zoo interlocking in Philadelphia looking absolutely magnificent. And here's the 4935 um, after its restoration in regular service, three years later on Amtrak 41, the Broadway, coming through Shade Gap, Pennsylvania. This is a little hamlet about halfway between Altoona and Harrisburg in April, 1980. Oh, oh, oh. Oh. Harrisburg and Philadelphia. Could you hear that, oh, is, Kevin? Is it between Harrisburg and Philadelphia? Okay. That's fine. That's Jeff. I, I might have I must have misread my Google Maps when I looked that up earlier this morning, but thank you. Um, anyway, it's Shade Gap. And uh, you're right, that does look like the track between Philly and uh, and Har and Harrisburg. Here we got the 4935. Um, I'm not sure that the photographer had the right date written down here, but here she is um, in Harrisburg, uh, still in regular service, uh, but she was retired not long after this. And of course, we all know she's part of the collection at the State Railroad Museum of Pennsylvania in Strasburg. Uh, I have very fond memories of this engine and that whole experience was really formative for me because I had just become editor of PTJ. And so the chance to cover something like this was, uh, was really exciting. Now we're gonna switch railroads and uh, look at a few photographs that I pulled from the RF and P folder. Uh, every railroad in the trains library is organized first by engine type, steam diesel, and then by car type, passenger and freight, and then by action views. And um, just about all these pictures I pulled from the steam action folder for the state of Virginia. And here we see elegant uh, 462 number 305 heading north through Doswell on October 4th, 1947. And I discovered in my research that apparently these were home built by the RFP in 1918 and then rebuilt in 1934. So uh, I had no idea RF and P built its own steam engines, but that seems to be what I discovered. But they were beautiful, weren't they? Here's that same engine in a fantastic view, roaring toward the photographer in December, 1944. This is one of the few Lucius BB prints that still reside in the Kalmbach Library. And when I ran across it, I knew we couldn't, I didn't want to pass up the chance to include it. Some knock BB for sticking with the three quarter wedge approach to photography. And of course he was pretty religious about that. But I think this photograph proves that there are wedge shots and then there are wedge shots. And there's nothing about this great action view that to me is not dramatic. I think it's a fantastic picture by BB. Still on the RFMP, the great Southern uh, small s photographer C.W. Whitbeck caught up with one of uh, RFMP's beautiful Berkshires at Alexandria in 1946. The RFMP had 10 of these beautiful 284s, all built by Lima in 1943. And I can't help but make a comparison between these and the Pierre Marquette Berkshires that I'm associated with through my years at Michigan State University. I must say that the RF and P engines looked a little more muscular maybe than the Pierre Marquette engines did. And uh, it's, a, it's, a handsome, it's a handsome engine. But the greatest of all RF and P engines were certainly their 484s. They had, uh, I think, 27 of them. 
five in an earlier class and then 22 uh, in, in this later class. And uh, here we see the one named for Richard Henry Lee on seaboard airline train 96 in Alexandria in February 52. The locomotive was named for one of the more prominent members of Virginia's famous Lee family. Uh, Richard Henry Lee, among other things, served in the U.S. Senate in the late 1790s. And the photographer is in the room. Yeah, photographer, right back here. Really? Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful, Mr. Wow. Hopkins. Congratulations. That's a great picture. Thank you. <laughs> wow. Um, and now we have a, a, a publicity picture from Union Switch and Signal uh, of another RF&P 484. I don't know which one it is. Uh, on Seaboard's Silver Comet at AP Tower in April 1949. Uh, and obviously the photograph was taken to kind of show off the track work and the interlocking and the signals, but it's still a fine photograph. Uh, the Silver Comet was um, Seaboard's New York, Washington, Birmingham train, at least for most of its life. It is a AF Tower. AF Tower in Alexandria. It's called AF yeah. Oh, it is AF. I, all I had to do was look at the photograph. Duh. <laughs> okay. I think I think the guy who sent the picture in had an AP on the back of the print, and I just merely copied what he had. Thank you. I, I love it when you when you chime in with that kind of thing. All right. Switching to the BNO. Uh, this is a photograph that unfortunately I don't have an identification for. If anybody might know who it is, please shout out. But it's a great photo of an EM1 cresting the summit of the Alleghenies at Altamont. Uh, I wish I could conclude, conclude the photographer's name as well as the date. I don't know. But alas, there was nothing on the back of the print. And that, that's not very often, but it's an occasional problem with some of the photos in our library. Here's another EM1 leading an eastbound coal train at Tunnelton, West Virginia in June 1950. As I'm sure many of you know, Bill Price was almost certainly the Dean of B&O Photographers, or at least one of them, that's for sure. And his work appeared frequently in trains throughout the late 1940s and into the 1950s and beyond, both, both in color and, and black and white. And to me, this is almost a perfectly composed three-quarter action view of, a, of really what was one of the great articulated engines of all time. Ben Cutler of the Boston-based Rail Photo Service got this dramatic shot of an EM-1 accelerating away from the photographer in Deer Park, Maryland in June 1951. And this really shows that fantastic uh, running gear of those EM-1s to good effect here in this picture. I have a feeling this really wonderful shot of another EM-1 is another William Bill Price image. I don't know though, because once again, this was another one of those pictures that had nothing on the back. And it's also taken at an unidentified, an unidentified location in the Alleghenies. Uh, if anybody has a good guess as to where this is, please shout out. But uh, I, I didn't want to not include it because it's just such a great action view of these wonderful engines doing their thing. Now I know this was a Bill Price photo showing a gleaming 482, fresh from overhaul, hauling a coal train over the horseshoe curve at Mance, Pennsylvania in June, 1954. And uh, I've, I've spent an afternoon at Mance at least once, and I know the, the, the look of the place has changed, but it's still a wonderful place, as I'm, I'm sure many of you know, to hang out and watch, uh, watch the action on CSX. Here's another Bill Price shot, uh, and this time showing one of B&O's Stout 2102s muscling a merchandise train near Cumberland, which I understand was Price's hometown back in August 1947. And I wish I knew the circumstances behind this stunning view, showing both the Western Maryland on the left and the B&O on the right with a train straddling the Potomac River in the area of the famous Paw Paw Bends. And pictures like this anymore are getting to be dime a dozen as we all, as so many of us have mastered the art of drone photography. 
but here's an early example of a shot that I don't believe is aerial. I think the photographer just found himself a, a really great perspective to shoot. Maybe you can still shoot this same picture, although I have a feeling everything that you see here is pretty grown in as it seems to be everywhere these days. Yeah. Okay. Um, Bill Price clearly did some climbing here. One hopes not too dangerously. I don't know the territory here, but he's at a wonderful overlook to get this shot of what looks to be a B&O Pacific calling train 22, the Washingtonian at Patterson Creek interlocking in April, 1951. And it's unusual uh, in a vertical format. Most everything that we pull from the library that has Bill Price's name on it is a horizontal picture. Uh, here, here's Bill again. Um, uh, here he's got uh, a meet between a westbound B&O train and a Cincinnati school special, as you can see from the drum head on the back of the uh, last car. Uh, at uh, This is at the same location, uh, Patterson Creek, in uh, April 1947. And the tail sign credits both the B&O Railroad and Cincinnati Public High School schools, I think, plural. No, plural. Uh, no, it's singular. Cincinnati Public High School. I'm assuming that represents a number of high school kids from all over the city. Nice picture, though. And here we've got... Uh, proof that uh, Bill Price wasn't choosy about what he shot when it came to steam versus diesel. Here are four perfectly matched F7s leading empty hoppers out of Cumberland at McKenzie Tower in October 1949. My great friend and uh, longtime boss Dave Ingalls got this shot of RDCs. Dave had a thing for RDCs. In fact, there's a big spread of his color photography of RDCs in the upcoming winter 2022 issue of Classic Trains. But unknown to me when I picked this a couple of years ago, I just pulled it out because I liked it as a, as a shot. It's, it's hard to show RDCs looking very dramatic, but I think Dave did a nice job with it here, especially since there's all that exhaust coming off those uh, GM diesels mounted atop each of these cars. Here's the great Bill Middleton photographing uh, a scene at Washington Union Station of a GG1 leading the PRR train, the representative out of Washington in November 67. Not long before we all know, PRR would merge with New York Central to form the uh, ill-fated Penn Central. Knowing Bill, and, and I knew Bill quite well, I'm sure what drew him to this particular picture is the opportunity to uh, highlight all that complex catenary. And this was taken in 1967. The late Jim Shaughnessy was a master of the night photograph, as many of you know, something he began perfecting in the late 1940s in his hometown of Troy, New York. It held him in good stead on a warm night in June 1960 when he managed to bag a whole bunch of EMD cab units of three different railroads at Ivy City Engine Terminal. Here we see units of B&O, C&O, and Southern. Steam mixes with electric as double-headed B&O engines, and from what I can tell, they look like switchers, bring a, a, a string of cars into Washington Union Station in 1947. World War II is raging in June 1943 when the photographer, and he's unnamed. No, there he is. His name's Paul Schmick. I'm sorry. I don't know if he was a publicity photographer. It almost has the look of of an official photograph. But Mr. Schmidt got this great view of uh, Washington Union Station's you know, main entrance. Uh, and the grounds are crowded with a, a wonderful selection of cars, taxi cabs, and buses. And, uh, and it's a very tense time in history, but it's still a beautiful scene to behold all these years later. A more contemporary shot is this view at Union Station that uh, my friend uh, Scott Hartley got of a Washington Terminal RS-1 cutting cars off Amtrak's Cardinal in uh, 1977. In a scene that 
probably doesn't look all that different today in some ways, although I'm sure the RS1 is long gone. All the t although the train is backing up in this photograph, the photographer uh, still managed to compose what I think is a very fine action shot of a GG1 moving PRR's head end heavy red arrow back into Union Station in August 1951. I was specially drawn to the uh, way the photographer mixed the uh, huge semaphore bridges with the track work and the train uh, nicely composed at just the right angle. Freshly washed and maybe freshly painted, here we see GG1 4831 ready to depart Union Station with the judiciary in 1946. An example of the fine photographic work by H.W. Ponton of the Rail Photo Service of Boston, which I'm sure some of you know will remember was a, a kind of a loose-knit group of photographers who bounded together in sort of a collective organization called Rail Photo Service uh, for the purpose of promoting their photography and getting more widely published. And Ponton was very good at the game. Moving north to Baltimore, I ran across a great pair of photos showing the area around Penn Station, including this ancient view of a Pensy 040 moving cars into position at some point before the current station was built in 1911. It's hard to know what year this photograph was taken, but I'm sure it was late 1890s, maybe around 1900. Uh, I'm sure some of you are familiar with the station that once stood in the in the distance. If you're not familiar with it in person, certainly you maybe have seen photographs of it. I could not find in the trains file a photograph of the earlier Pennsylvania station here. But uh, we do have this fine photo by Don Wood, where almost everything in the photograph is new compared to the earlier shot, except that wonderful um, St. Paul Street Bridge which is still visible across the middle of the photograph. Visible on the left, of course, is the Penn Station built in 1911, as well as all the extensive platforms that went with it. And on the right, you can see a GG1 trundling uh, through the scene with a northbound train. I never knew about Pensy's Calvert Street Station in Baltimore which apparently dated to the Civil War era. It certainly looks like that from the architecture. But here's a fine shot of it from 1946. Obviously, the platforms that used to be there, I'm, I'm guessing there was a train shed at some point, which is long gone. But here we see a Pensy, this, I almost love this more than the station, E5 Class Atlantic, moving out with what appears to be a local train in 1946. And the photographer, I'm, I'm sad to say, is unidentified, but he did get another shot of the same train a few minutes later. Having left Calvert Street, the 4133 leads its train toward Penn Station under the elevated trolley line. Again, this was all taken in June 1946. And I love the shot of the grade crossing watchman uh, doing his job and looking quite officious while he's, while he's at it. <laughs> How could GG1s look any better than this in this view of double-headed Gs crossing the bridge at Havre de Gras in July, 1956? Not sure what the train is, but it appears it might be a maintenance of way train hauling poles for uh, maintenance along the, uh, along the electrified main line. A great shot by James Gallagher. We'll see more of him coming up here, including this shot of a nice picture of the Pensy P5A emerging from the tunnel in Baltimore in 1957. Um, I didn't know much about the P5A till I discovered this photo and did a little digging. And I found out that it didn't really predate the GG1. It kind of emerged around the same time. Um, and um, I think the first GG1s were built just a year or so ahead of this particular P5A. That sounds right. Thank you. Here's a here's a wonderful photography photograph. Uh, this this publicity photo is widely known. I wouldn't be surprised if everybody in the room there has probably seen it several times. Showing a four six two and the Capital Limited along the CNO Canal, probably in the mid nineteen thirties. 
longtime trains editor, Dave Morgan, who was a, a colleague of mine in the 70s and a friend, he counted the Capitol as among his favorite trains. And for many years, he had a giant framed, heavily framed version of this photo hanging in his office at 1027 North 7th Street in downtown Milwaukee. And that original giant print, probably a gift of the railroad, probably a, a gift from Edward Hungerford to, to Dave. Um, it, that, that picture still hangs in um, the Kambach Media Building in suburban Waukesha, Wisconsin. And, and it was taken before 1924 because that's when the canal was abandoned. Okay, that's good to know. It, it certainly looks like the 20s. It looks like the heyday of the 20s, doesn't it? With all that fabulous heavyweight equipment. Love this photograph. And you can see the tow guy uh, you know, operating the boat on the canal. Another lovely photograph that I've admired for several years, and I think I, I think I actually picked this out to run in trains back in the 90s, or maybe it was in uh, Trains Illustrated, even in the late 80s. Uh, I don't know who Fitzpatrick Photo Service was, possibly a commercial photography outfit from Baltimore hired by the railroad, but here we see a streamlined P7462 leading the westbound Cincinnati and past Sandy Hook, Maryland near Harper's Ferry in December 52. And uh, this really shows you just how beautiful that Cincinnati train was. It's a shame it, it's a shame it didn't last longer on the Washington Cincinnati run, but uh, you know, it had a few good years running up to Detroit as well after that. Here's an interesting picture by H.N. Proctor showing a, an oncoming b &O train at Fort Meade Junction in 1954. And uh, I must concept, confess, I, I, I did some online research and I'm, I'm not sure what railroads came together or what junction that is at Fort Meade. I'm sure some of you know that. Okay. Um, wasn't sure, quite sure I understood that, but I'm sure everybody in the crowd heard it. Thanks. Um, this is uh, this is clearly an earlier photo. Uh, no, this, no, this is this is Jan, another James Gallagher shot. This is a wonderful shot. I'm getting out of order here. Framing a P7 on uh, train 20, the Ambassador, uh, um, at Thomas Viaduct in the winter of 1952-53. And the ambassador linked Baltimore and Washington with Pittsburgh, Toledo, and Detroit. <laughs> Back at Fort Meade Junction, the photographer, Mr. Proctor, is standing atop the tender of a work extra as a P-7 approaches with a westbound passenger train in August 1953. Not sure how he got permission from the crew to be up there, but it made for a made for a great photograph. Clearly, an earlier photo from the Kambach collection, probably early 1940s. This is a Pacific built in 1927, backing into Union Station before making a run up to Jersey City on the BNO. I wish I had the exact year, but I don't. But the uh, the engine is clean and beautiful, and the Side rods are spit and polish and in the perfect rods down position. Here's another example of uh, Jim Shaughnessy's skill at night photography. Uh, this is an E6 and E7 paired up at Ivy City awaiting assignment, probably taken the same night as our earlier photo. In fact, I'm sure it was. This was in June, 1960. Drama from the camera of Otto C. Perry, a man associated mostly with Colorado railroading, showing a BNO 462 hustling a New York bound train out of Washington as a GG1 on the Pensy gains on it on the adjacent track. This is not the photo that David P. Morgan wrote about when he did a, a frontispiece back in the late 60s called Somebody Bet on the GG1, but it's close. Uh, I don't think it's the same photograph, but it's the same idea of one railroad, quote unquote, racing another. <laughs> uh, 
Here's a beautiful EA cab unit leading the diplomat past Ivy City on its way to Jersey City in a H.A. McBride photo that was not dated, but I assume this is uh, mid-1940s. Mount Royal Station must have been a lovely place to watch trains, as we witness in this view by James Gallagher showing a P-7 departing with the Washingtonian in 1952. And uh, this photo was published in trains, I believe in the 90s. I can't remember the reason for which we chose it, but I always loved it and I wanted to include it today. Uh, just to, well, for one thing, it just shows you what you can do with backlighting if you know what you're doing and you've got a flair for composition, which Gallagher certainly had in spades. Here we've got Gallagher again. All of these uh, Alco FA diesels are somewhat obscured. I still like the shot of Alco power on the bridge over the Patapsco River, showing a coal train emerging from the tunnel in uh, 19, September 1956. And perhaps on the same day, let me check the dates here. Um, he got another shot of F7s leading a westbound freight at the same location. And you can see the date and the name of the tunnel, Ilchester, um, on, the port of, on the portal of the tunnel in the background. With its streamlined shroud, uh, P7 Pacific 5301 doesn't look much like the 462 that emerged from, it emerged from Baldwin in its original form back in 1927. But here we see it leading the westbound Cincinnati and at Mountain Lake Park in June 1950. <clears throat> I noticed on Google Street View this morning that the station still exists, parts of it anyway, although it's been severely chopped up. But another great photograph by Bill Price. Now we're switching to the CNO. Here we see one of CNO's big Pacifics racing past. P.Y. Tower with the Sportsman in 1951. The Sportsman was a Washington, D.C. Detroit train that for a time had its eastern terminus actually at Phoebus, Virginia. I believe it's pronounced that way. Phobus, Phoebus, also considered Hampton across the bay from Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, I, some people might knock the C&O for the way they hung those air pumps on the front of the engine, but I think it gave it a pretty imposing appearance. I always liked it. Here's the sports. Here's the sportsman again. This time at RO Tower in Arlington, in April 1949. This is another publicity photo from Union Switch and Signal, obviously showing off the uh, interlocking equipment and the signaling. Uh, we see 464 number 490 doing the honors. It started out life as a 462, then it was when it was built by Alco in 1926, later streamlined and converted to the Hudson wheel arrangement in 47. And this would be a great one to see in color with that brilliant yellow nose. Another converted Hudson, a Hudson converter from an F-19 Pacific, this time emerging from the tunnel in Washington in July, 1951. By the book that I checked this morning, the CNO had a total of four of these F-19 streamlined and upgrading to, upgraded to what they called the L-1 class 464. July 16th, 1951. This time it's an F-18 Pacific, bringing up the uh, George Washington across the Trestle at Hampton, Virginia, or Hampton, Maryland, in, 19, in Hampton, Virginia, 1951. The engine is one of six F-18s built in 1923 by Alco. And Bill Taub's credit line showed up on occasion during this search, and I don't know much about him, but he was very good at what he did. And here's one of my favorites in the entire program. Uh, this shows the great 484-614 roaring into Hampton Roads in 1950 in a great shot by H. Reed, the Norfolk area newspaper reporter and photographer, and of course, frequent contributor to Trains Magazine. 
you all probably know that H made a big deal out of keeping his first name obscure. Um, I think I recently found out a few years ago what the H meant, but to tell you the truth, I've forgotten. The 614, of course, is famous for its service on the Chessie steam specials of the 1980s, the Chessie Safety Express. And it's still stored today at Clifton Forge, Virginia, and still presumably owned by Ross Rowland. But this is just about the most fantastic regular service shot of that engine I've ever seen. And I enjoyed many happy hours riding behind it, mainly across Indiana when it ran out of Chicago. Another view of a CNO Greenbrier, this time the class engine, number 600, crossing the RF and P at Doswell, Virginia with the Sportsman in July, 1947. A few years later now, and it's E8 diesels on the Sportsman as it departs Alexandria, in this case, using trackage rights over the Southern down to Orange, Virginia. Back in the original CNO diesel paint scheme and back in the day when they kept these engines nice and clean. Here's the trestle at Hampton, obviously a great place to get photos on the CNO as this classic 1951 view of E8s on the Sportsman shows. Note the presence of the fireman in the cab window, obviously enjoying having his picture taken, again by Mr. Bill Taub. Kevin Bill Taub was NASA's senior official photographer. Okay. For all the space launches. Oh, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Well, no wonder he was so good. No wonder he was so good at it. I need to do some research and find out more about him. I think he deserves some kind of a story in the magazine. I don't remember him ever getting much coverage in either classic trains or trains. He in Morrow, Maryland. He had a fantastic model railroad layout in his house. Oh, wow. That's great to know, too. Uh, the great Wallace W. Abbey, who was a friend of mine, was the managing editor of Trains Magazine when he had the presence of mind to shoot this view of Washington, D.C. and the Lincoln and Jefferson memorials from the rear platform of the sportsman, in this case, departing Washington in August 53. Wally was managing editor at this point, but he was gonna quit just a few months later uh, to go into the railroad industry's communication field. Uh, well, at first he worked for uh, Railway Age for a while, but then he went on to work for the Sioux Line and the Milwaukee Road, and then he was an independent PR man for many years. Uh, Wally's three and a half years at trains were incredibly productive, of course. And I can't help but mention a, a plug here, if you will. Uh, in a few weeks, hopefully within only two or three weeks, uh, Wally's great posthumous book, uh, The Diesel That Did It, is coming out from Indiana University Press, a book that I edited with his daughter, Martha Abbey Miller. And we worked on this book over the last two years, gave it to Indiana University Press about a year ago, and it's just about finished. We've seen the layouts, of course, and it's beautiful. So keep an eye out for that. It's a history of the FT diesel, the development of the FT diesel by EMC slash EMD, and its introduction on the Santa Fe in 1940, 41, around those times. By 1970, the CNO's passenger trains were starting to look a little down at the heels as we witness in this shot of the Virginia section of the George Washington at Williamsburg. And on this day, uh, Amtrak's inauguration is a little over a year away. Another great photographer from your area, uh, William E. Warden, who I've enjoyed, I've enjoyed working with his photographs over the years. One of my favorite Amtrak trains was the Washington section of the old Broadway, which came down to DC from Harrisburg and followed the Susquehanna pretty much all the way. I, I rode the train in 1976, all the way from Chicago and enjoyed having a short four car train seemingly all to myself. Uh, the Washington section didn't last all that much longer, but it was, a, it was a fun ride and it was a nice way to get the mileage because I'm a mileage collector, which is a terrible sickness to have, I must admit. Uh, here's a 1974 view of the Washington section at the Conowingo Dam, not far north of Port Deposit. And this is taken by another tremendously notable photographer. It's the only shot I have in the program, but this was, is indeed by the great J.J. Young Jr. 
Here's the Washington section of the Broadway again, this time preparing to depart Union Station in April 1976. Switching over to the Southern Railway, here we see the Piedmont hustling out of Washington behind an FP7. I believe this photo, which was undated, was taken during the 1970s when the Southern was running the Piedmont as a Washington Atlanta day train, kind of supplementing the Crescent. But the Piedmont was eliminated by 1976. In happier days, here we see Southern's Southerner speeding away from Washington Union Station in 1948. In its heyday, the Southerner was a Washington New Orleans train, but it was combined with the Crescent in 1970 to form what was then christened the Southern Crescent, the train we associate with, um, uh, with um, Mr. Clater, the train that ran independently of Amtrak until 1979. But I just love the way this photograph had so much going on in it. The Alco switcher, the streamliner speeding away, all that incredible switch work, the catenary. Uh, there's something unique about the area surrounding Union Station. And this, this photograph does a great job of showing it. And of course, no surprise, it, it was a very talented photographer who got the shot, Frank Clodfelter, longtime Southern Railway locomotive engineer and very frequent contributor to trains back in those days. Here we have uh, still E6 diesels on the Southern roster when Jim Shaughnessy caught up with number 2,900. I think it's 2,900. It's kind of hard to read through the reflection on the number board at the roundhouse at Ivy City in 1960. My records show that the Southern had only seven of these E6s all delivered by EMD in 1941. But another example of Jim Shaughnessy's talent with flash, flash bulbs and night photography. Here's Southern Train 42, the Pelican, stopping at Alexandria in September 1965. The, uh, the Pelican ran along the famous route of the Birmingham Special, linking Washington with Roanoke, Radford, two towns in Virginia, and Knoxville, Tennessee, down to New Orleans. The train was combined with the Birmingham Special in 1970, and then, of course, ended with the advent of Amtrak in 1971. Sometimes the uh, photographers the railroads hired for publicity pictures came out with, I think, very artful results. As witnessed this shot of the South Bend Southerner behind what looks to be an E6, passing a farm between Brandy and Culpeper, Virginia, in the fall of 1951. Northbound. Northbound. Some people think it's northbound, yeah. Oh, do they? Okay. Um, all right. Well, um, I will. I'll try to remember to correct the back of the print because <laughs> it said southbound. Yeah. Nice shot, though. Nice, nice shot for publicity picture. Some publicity pictures are kind of sterile, but this certainly isn't the case. Of course, I can't help but wonder if the draft horses were sort of arranged to be there. But uh, but who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Here's the uh, Crescent Limited at what some would consider its high water mark before streamlined lightweight cars racing out of Alexandria in 1946. In another photo taken by the great Frank Clodfelter. And finally, I end up tonight's pictures with uh, this interesting little evening view of the uh, Southern Crescent in 1972, departing Alexandria behind four of the famous E8s uh, adorned with that distinctive paint scheme. And I was wrong, I do have two photographs by J.J. Young Jr. and this is, this is one of them. So that brings me to the end of the uh, photographs I have for everybody tonight. I hope everyone's enjoyed the, uh, the lineup and I certainly had a lot of fun pulling all this stuff from the files and scanning it and putting it together for you. So thanks very much. And Bill, any questions, or uh, I'd be happy to take any questions from the group if we can, if that's something we can manage. Is uh, is Bill Schaefer there today in the audience? Yeah. Yes, he is. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you for the texts, Bill. <laughs> <laughs>
And uh, uh, I, I, I've been avoiding the temptation to look at my phone during the presentation. So then I just picked it up again, and I've got like like twelve minute twelve messages from Schaefer, <laughs> which I love. That's great. <laughs> Contemporaneous correction, huh? Uh, yeah, Melvin. Well, yeah, that's right. He was making some good corrections, which I will, uh, which I'll remember and make changes in this thing if I do this program again. I'm wondering why all the photographs were black and white and not in color. Well, um, boy, I could go on for hours about that. Uh, if you want the straight answer, I'll give it to you. There's two reasons. Number one, uh, the slides, as they're organized in the trains library, are very spotty. Um, I would I would guess that the editors of trains 98 percent of the time when they're looking for color, they get it from the outside from contributors. OK, because the what because the, the, the slide collection in the trains library is frankly is heavily oriented toward the model railroader staff. So there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of slides showing cars or simple roster shots or that kind of stuff. But if you're looking for a dramatic photography, the, the trains library is not a good place to go for color. So then that leaves you with the, um, well, two other options. Number one is what the editors normally do, which is to try and recruit a lot of contributors to bring in stuff, especially for specific subjects, which is easy to do. And then we re re return the slides after they're scanned. There's also a lot of stuff archived on the servers at Kambach, but ferreting out how to find something in the subject matter you're interested in is very, very time consuming and difficult. In addition to that, I'm working remotely from home, and I have to tell you that even though I can hook up into the Combox servers, and this is way more information than you guys want, it takes forever to download a photograph, just a single photograph, out of those servers. So uh, in order to keep my blood pressure at a manageable level, I decided to make this a black and white program. <laughs> Thank you, Kevin. Yeah. Anybody else want to raise their hand and ask questions? John, did you want to? Yeah, uh, yeah Kevin, I, I, that was an interesting picture of Union Station during wartime. And, and I, I have read that, that the government discouraged taking pictures of trains during that time. Is that one era where there's not a lot of existing material photographed? Abs absolutely. Um, there, there is some. I mean, the, the arrival of Trains Magazine in 1940 certainly encouraged a lot of people to, to do what they could or, or actually to shoot what they could get away with that without getting in trouble. But there's no question that all of a sudden around um, fall of 1945, you start to see a lot more pictures as you're thumbing through the, um, through the files of stuff. So uh, it, it was definitely, it was, it was definitely difficult to get as much as you needed then. In fact, I think a lot of the trains pictures in those days, they really depended on stuff that was issued by the railroad companies which passed muster with the censors. Some of you might know too that the trains uh, suffered under the restrictions of the times too by having to print a lot of its magazine in 43, 44 on newsprint. Um, and uh, uh, at least some of the pages, or some of the forms of the magazine were on newsprint and uh, they don't hold up very well, but uh, that's a good point to make, yeah. Anybody else have a question you wanna raise your hand? Very good. Well, I guess uh, thank thank you very much, uh, Kevin. We love the show. It really was great. Uh -huh. and, uh, great. Well, I appreciate it, Bill. I appreciate all the help on the technical side. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> it never goes as smooth as I hope, but I think it did okay tonight. You know? <laughs> Today. Well, yeah. en enjoy the rest of the day, and a shout out to Bill and Alex and and uh, and and Schaefer and everybody else that I know there. It's it's a real pleasure to be there. I wish I could be there in person, but. Uh, I'll come back someday if you're interested. Well, that, yeah. That'd be terrific, yes, absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.